All right, last class we ended with uh, this problem. X equals Y squared minus 4Y. X equals 2Y minus Y squared. And we were asked to find the area between these curves. And so we, we were looking at using your calculators, the parametric mode. And hopefully you had a little bit of time to mess around with that and uh, get somewhat comfortable with it because it'll just help you in your drawing. Um, and on the test, I'll, I will ask for the drawing. So let's go ahead and continue this and put my X and Y axes here. I'm going to draw my two graphs. And this is a very rough drawing. The important, ooh, that's real rough. The important thing here in our drawing and on your calculator is to help you realize where your, your points of intersection are and that'll help you get your bounds for your integral. Um, also, when you're setting this up, make sure you draw in here what one of your arbitrary rectangles would look like. In this case, our rectangle would be horizontal, right? And let's find our intersection points algebraically. That means we want to know where these two graphs hit each other, and we want to know it in terms of the y values. Like where does it hit and where does it hit? One of them is obvious from the picture, right? Zero. But the other one we'd have to get. So how do we do that? We set the two things equal to each other. So I'm going to set y squared minus 4y equal to 2y minus y squared. This is an equation in y, meaning that y is the variable, right? And it's a quadratic equation, so I'll move every, everything to one side. So I'll move both these terms over to the left side, which gives me 2y squared uh, minus 6y equals zero. Factor GCF. Two solutions, zero and three. That means the y value up here is three. And of course the y value down there was zero. That gives me my limits of integration, right? And now it's just a matter of identifying, you know, which function to put on top and bottom. You know, when we were doing the other way, where our rectangle was up and down, we had like the top and bottom function. Here it's always going to be the, the function on the right is going to be the one we put first and then minus the one on the left. The book uses a notation where they subscript with an R and an L. I'm just going to do it like this. Um, We want integral from C to D of F of Y minus G of Y dy. That's the integral we're trying to set up, right? Which, which of the two functions is the one that opens this way to the left? See, that, that's where your calculator might help you if you, don't under, you know, if you are unclear on it. So which one of them opens to the left like that? Is it the y squared minus 4y, or is it the 2y minus y squared? It's the 2y minus y squared. That's the one that opens to the left. So that's, that's going to be my f. This will be my f function. The g function will be the bottom one. So help me, help me set up this integral. What is it going to be? Okay. 2y minus y squared minus y squared minus 4y dy. And then the integral goes from 0 to 3. And then all you have to do is distribute through 
and you're pretty much there. And then you take the antiderivative and so integral is zero to three. Uh, let's see, 2y, let's go ahead and collect like terms here. You should have 6y minus 2y squared. That sounds like reindeer out there or something. What is that? What is it? Is it in the building? Selling ice cream? Entrepreneur. <coughs> Anyone have an area yet? Should be what? 3y squared is the antiderivative minus 2 thirds y cubed, right? 0 to 3. Something like that. Okay, you, you can do that on your own. But the idea is here, right? Everything's good? No questions? The, I think the most challenging part of it for you is just going to be making sure you get your drawing correct and make sure you understand where the, where the intersection points are. That can be somewhat challenging. Uh, let's do a different problem that uh, I guess we have to interpret the wording, which makes things a little more challenging. The example is find the area between, or actually, you know what, don't say between, enclosed by these equations, y equals sine x, y equals x, x equals pi over 2, x equals pi. So if you were to do this, you would want to probably get your calculator out. I mean, I know you can all graph sine. Everyone can graph y equals sine x. That's, I mean, by hand, you should be able to do that. But the calculator may help you because, look, if I, if I graph sine, I know it looks like this, right? And I know y equals x looks like the diagonal, something like that. Agreed? But then what does x equals pi over 2 look like? Vertical line that goes through pi over 2. Pi over 2 is right here. And then pi is out here. Right? This is x equals pi. This is x equals pi over 2. Then we have y equals x. And then the black one here is y equals sine x. With my drawing, I, c I really can't tell where that region is because I don't know how accurate my drawing is. Does that make sense? So it's, it's probably better to do it with the calculator. What you'll see here, if you do it with the calculator, is that the region is actually, I was pretty darn close. If I extend this blue line up, the region enclosed by all of them is this and here. Right there, like that. But the, but the graphing calculator, graphing utility will help verify that that's the region. The, the worst thing you can do on a test is set up an integral off the wrong region because you lose a lot of points for that. You can, but you don't have to. 
you can switch back to traditional function. Now, t let's 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 talk about that. Why why do you not need to do it the other way? That they're solved for y. Correct. Another way to look at it, though, is that if you look at that region there. The rectangle that I'm going to draw, that's going to represent the area sliver, right? That little sliver of area. That right there, I can draw it vertically. And the function on top and bottom are different, which is what you need. Right? The last example, we couldn't draw it vertically. Horizontal. Well, you could, but yes, you could, but what would happen is that if you draw from left to right, you would have to do three different integrals. Because you would have to go from here to where this hits one integral, because your bottom function here is different than the top. And then when you get from here to here, it's, it's this line instead of this. Then it would switch again to this line. Does that make sense? So it's, this is the cleanest way to do it. You just have, you'll just have one integral. All that's going to do, x is pi over 2 and x is pi, is gives us our limits of integration. It's where we're going to start and stop. That's, that's right. Well, you could, but you don't need to. Okay, so this is your, your regular old integral for area, which is integral a to b, f of x, Minus g of x dx. That's going to turn out to be your a and b. Yes. Had they not given that to us, we would have had to have tried to figure out where they intersect, and that would have been tough. Yeah. It's actually a very tough problem to figure out where sine x equals x. You can't do it algebraically. So what, what our limits of integration here are, are what cuts off our green region, so pi over 2 to pi. And then what function is on top and what function is on bottom? X is on top minus the sine x is on bottom, dx. Now, what you might want to do is you might want to get this rectangle and bring it out here and say, okay, how high is this? Well, the top of it, right, the top of that rectangle is, is the, the blue line, isn't it? That's x. Minus the bottom of that rectangle is the sine curve. So that, that's minus sine x. Y'all see that? That's your height. And then, of course, the width of this rectangle is what? dx. And so when you multiply the two, you get the integrand. That's, that's what we have there. That makes sense. There we didn't have to solve, set two things equal to each other. So you can integrate those, right? Antiderivative of x, 1 half x squared. Antiderivative of sine, right? Negative cosine. So. All right, very good. Let's do another. How about 4x squared plus y squared equals 12, x equals y. By the way, I, I, before I forget this, I do need to make an announcement. Um, today, I have to go to a wedding in Austin. Actually, it's north of Austin, 120 miles from my house. It's going to take two and a half hours to get there, according to Google Maps. Okay. This, I should pause this because if my wife ever watches this, she can give me shit. This is my wife's family. They're having a wedding tonight at 6 o'clock in Austin. Thursday night in Austin. Everyone lives in San Antonio. So, which means that I have to leave here to get there safely by like 3.30, right? And there's a lot of things I have to, anyway, I found this out this morning, leaving the house, that we were gonna go. 
Well, see, I think it's going to be longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. We'll be there at the reception. That might be good. Just go there and just drink. But <laughs> anyways, uh, with that said, it's unexpected. It happened. You know, my wife was able to get off work. I don't even know why she even asked. But we're going to go. And uh, so after this class, I plan on going back to my office for about 15 minutes, and then I'm, I'm out. I've got stuff I need to take care of before I go. So I apologize, but we'll be back tonight, and I'll be here tomorrow. So let's do this. We want to find the area of the region enclosed by these two. So I give you two curves. Find the area of the region that they enclose. Yeah, see, this problem, the reason why I want to show you this problem is because you know that if, if it's y equals and then functions, you can use your calculator, right? If it's x equals some functions of y, then you can use your calculator in parametric mode to graph. Um, here, you're, one of them, y equals x, you could look at that either way, right? That's solved for x and y, so it doesn't matter. This one, though, 4x plus y squared equals 12, you want to solve that for y or x. Which one is easier? Probably x, right? It's easier to just isolate x here. Because if you do y, you're going to have to do a square root, aren't you? And that means you're going to have a plus or minus, which means you're actually going to create two functions instead of just one, which may cause issues. So, you know, just solve for x. Let's go to parametric mode on our calculators. We're not going to freak out about it. That all right? Who were the students who didn't have calculators before? Where are they? You have something now? You, you, you learn how to use it a little bit? Did you just get one or did you find a friend? Really? Is it a used one? Good. TI-89? That's the basic one. That same brains as the, is the, the fancy ones now. It's the same exact brains. So... That's a good price. All right. Did you? Yes. yes. You're good also? Okay, good. All right. Well, let's, I'll, I'll save us time because we have a lot to do. You'll want to make sure you can graph this on your own to get your region. You're going to have something like, you have your diagonal function, which is y equals x, or x equals y, I should put. And then you have this parabola looking thing that does something like this. Wow, that's really bad. Now, which type of uh, rectangles are we going to do? Vertical or horizontal? Horizontal, right? Our horizontal rectangles look like this. <coughs> Anytime our integral has y in it, like dy, it's horizontal. Anytime it's dx, it's vertical, right? That makes sense? Uh, we are going to need intersection points. So we'll have to set them equal to each other. And what else? Uh, let's get the intersection. I'm using the boxed ones and setting them equal to each other. So I'm going to replace what? In, in this first boxed one on the left side, I'm going to replace what with what? Yes, just replace the x on the left side with y. That's basically using the second equation, substituting it in there. Where I see x, I put y. So I put y equals 3 minus 1 fourth y squared. Um, move everything over to one side. 1 fourth y squared plus y minus 3 equals 0. I'm going to multiply by 4. Because I don't like fractions. Well, I like fractions, but there's no need to have them if, if you can get rid of them. Get rid of them, right? Multiply both sides by 4. Factor. That does factor, right? And therefore, my two solutions are negative 6 and positive 2.
And those represent my, my C and D on my integral. So that's going to give me my negative 6 and then up here my positive 2. Make sense? This is a major shifting of gears from what we would been doing, right? Partial fractions and all the trig sub and all that. I mean, this is this is a lighter dose of math, right? Which is which is good. We've got some of the harder stuff out of the way. Any questions? Um, I'm going to draw that little rectangle over here. The importance of drawing the rectangle is going to come into play when we jump into 7.2 today. You'll see how having this drawing helps. So let's talk about the width. And it's going to be the one on the right minus the one on the left in this case. So which one is on the right? So, so we're looking at it's, it's, it's Remember, it's almost like you're turning your head like this. The one on top and bottom now. It's the 3, okay, 3 minus 1 fourth y squared. But then you're subtracting from that the one on the bottom, which is y. That makes sense? No questions? I don't need parentheses. So my integral, which I'm not going to evaluate, goes from negative 6 to 2 of the top, or side function, however you want to say it, the one on the right, minus the one on the left, dy. And those can all be integrated term by term, power rule, or in business. Next one. How about, same thing, find the area of the region enclosed by um, y equals x to the second, y equals x to the fourth, x greater than or equal to zero. Good. What about this one? So you graph them. x squared is a parabola, right? x to the fourth also looks like a parabola, doesn't it? So one parabola goes like this. That's x. Let's say that's x squared. Where is x to the fourth relative to that one. It's wider. Where, okay, let me ask you this. It's a wider base, so is it below this one or above this one? Well, here, this might help. What, what happens if you plug one into both of these functions? You're, so you know that they hit each other here, right? Let's just say that that's 1 and this is 1. Well, that's supposed to be 1. You know that they both, they both start at 0. They both, they both meet at 1. One of them is above the other one. Between 0 and 1, one of them is above and one of them is below. Which one is above, which one is below? Wider is correct, but think of it in terms of okay, x to the 4th is below. Now, this is one of those things that, that people can get confused about. If I say I take a number and square it, right, you get something. If I say now raise it to the fourth, most people think it gets bigger, right? I mean, that's like, you know, if I say, hey, take a number two, square it, it's four. But take two and raise it to the fourth, it's even bigger. That's not always true. If the number is between zero and one, it's actually opposite. Like take the number one half. Square it, you get one fourth. But if you take number one half and raise it to the fourth, you get one sixteenth. So between zero and one, x to the fourth is actually below 
but then they meet at one, and then after one, the x to the fourth is above the x squared. Okay? That's important because I want to know the area enclosed by both. And also notice this part of the problem, x greater than or equal to zero. What did that do by putting that x greater than or equal to zero? That, mean, that, that meant I was forcing you to the right side of the y-axis. Because this actually goes back the other direction, doesn't it? It does the same thing. So I'm saying ignore all that stuff. The region that I want is this region in here. So what I would do if I, if I were doing this problem like on a test, after I mess around with my graph a little bit, mess around with my calculator, I'd probably redraw it. And I would draw a very exaggerated version of it, something like this, where I have like, you know, here's my x squared, right? And then down here would be my x to the fourth, y equals x to the fourth, y equals x squared. And that way I can really get my rectangle in here. Make sense? Now you can tell what the top and bottom one are. By the way, what are my limits of integration? Zero to one. Now, how would I have gotten them had I, had I not known that just by looking? Set them equal to each other. And now I want to solve this equation because I want to point out something that's very dangerous. I see people do it, even in calculus classes, that when they go to solve something like that, they divide both sides by x squared. Which you can do, but... Remember, if you come in and divide both sides of an equation by something, you have to promise that it's never zero, right? So if I, if I were to divide both sides by x squared here, you get x squared equals 1, right? And then take square root, you get plus or minus 1, which gives you two of the answers, but you're missing one, right? Where else do they hit? At zero. So you miss that solution by doing it that way. I guess my, my warning to you is, be careful when you divide both sides of an equation by a variable. Here's the proper way to do it. Just move the x squared over to the other side. Pull GCF. Factor the second one difference of squares. Now you get all the solutions. So anytime you have algebraic equations like that, and you have powers of x and things, don't ever divide through by, even if it was like you're dividing through by cosine x, you always introduce the possibility that you lost answers when you did that. All right, let's set up the integral. Integral, where to where? Zero to one. Which one, one is which one? Top is x squared minus x to the fourth dx. Again, a pretty clear, a pretty clean inter integral. I have one more example, and we're going to be done with this section. I want to try and be somewhat thorough. I'm just going to draw my rectangle over here. Talk about this being the top minus the bottom. And get used to the idea of drawing that rectangle. All right, can I move on? If the, if, let's say the x to the fourth was something, but it was below the x-axis, you would still subtract it. And it, it would be the top one, be the x squared minus whatever was down there. Because what would happen is since it's below the x-axis, the area is counted as negative, but you're subtracting it, so it winds up adding that area. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Say again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have a, f let's say we had something like this, where we had one function that was up here like this, and let's say another function that was down here like this. And I'm just trying to find the area between uh, all that area in there, okay? You could look at it as being this top area, right? That's just the integral of f. If that's, you know, if this is the f function, that's, that, that would be integral of f. Now, the other one below it, this area down here, we could say is the integral of g, but it would be negative. Because remember, we've, we've had problems where we get areas that are negative. Like that sign, the top canceled the bottom, remember that? So what we do is when we do f minus g here, top minus bottom, this minus the bottom turns out to be subtracting a negative area, which is the same as adding the area, so it actually adds it together. That's what you were saying, right? Something like that. Okay. All right, here we go. Yes, mm -hmm. it would work the same way, which is why when we turn our heads, we say top and bottom because positive is that direction, negative is this direction. All right, so here's, here's a result of what we've done, this and some stuff we've done in the past that you may not have even realized we can do. Show the area... of a circle with radius r is pi r squared. A formula we, we all have learned in our lives, right? Area of a circle is pi r squared. Now, let's see where that formula comes from. Let's start by taking a circle and orienting it at the origin, giving it a radius of r. Is that okay? Yeah? What is the equation of that circle? So you have to know what the standard form of, uh, of a circle is. And remember the standard form of circle? x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. That's the standard form of a circle with h and k being what? The center and r being the radius. Look, if, if you ever have a circle and you know its center and you know its radius, then you know the equation of that circle. Okay? Now, if that's the case, then what's the equation of this circle? What's the center? Zero, zero. What's the radius? R, right? So R, I mean, right? R is the radius, so what would this equation become for us in this problem? R squared. Okay, so that is the equation of, of a general circle centered at the origin radius R. Agreed? I want the area of it. Somebody tell me how I can figure out the area of that in terms of what we've been studying. Forget Riemann sums now. Let's use, let, I mean, yeah, we don't want it anymore. Antiderivative of what? Mm, that's too, well. Zero to where? Okay, zero to R. This is symmetric, right? So you're saying we could just find the area of this first quadrant? and just times four. So you're saying that that area would be, 
okay, I'm following you. I like this. It's the, it would, it would be an integral. It would go from where to where? Zero to R. But what are you integrating? Under that first part of that curve, right? Well, what's the curve? See, that's, that's what we need now. What is that curve? <clears throat> Here's the equation. I'm hearing a couple things there, sorry. It, okay, we either need to take that equation and solve it for x or solve it for y. It depends on which way you want to draw your rectangles. I want to draw my rectangles vertically. I want a rectangle like this. I know that the top function is that curve. The bottom function is 0, isn't it? It's just, that, it's just the x-axis, that's 0, y equals 0. But the top of that function is the curve. So solve that equation for a circle for y. Okay, can we do that over here on the side? y squared equals r squared minus x squared. Agreed? Now r is a constant, do you agree? Like r is just, that's the radius of the circle. x is a variable. Can you get y by itself without the square? Square root. Now we do introduce a little bit of a problem here because we have to do plus or minus, don't we? However, the plus part of that, the plus part of that square root function gives me the top of the circle. The negative gives me the bottom. So I only need to look at which one? The top. So isn't that my function then? My function is square root r squared minus x squared dx. That's because that rectangle over there has at the top of it, the top of it is that square root r squared minus x squared, and then minus the bottom, which is 0. Does that make sense or not? Can you integrate this? <coughs> trig sub. Trig sub. That's like an a squared minus u squared, or a squared minus x squared. But I think it's also a formula. Let's see if it's a formula. Oh, uh, it's not. <clears throat> well, it's, well, do you have reference page seven? Okay, you only have to six. Sorry, we have to show it. <laughs> reference page seven has the formula on it. But this is a good exercise for trig sub, all right? So we have something that looks like a squared minus x squared. What's the substitution when you have a squared minus x squared? X is a what? A sine theta. So for us, it will be what? X is R sine theta. Because instead of it being A squared, we have R squared. R is a constant. So the A is R. You all see it? What's dx then? R cosine theta d theta. And then what's, uh, what's all this turn out to be? R squared minus R cosine theta? So I'm doing a trig substitution here, right? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and try and rewrite this integral. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to write it down here. Um, this integral becomes, and I'm, I'm, forget the 0 and R for now. Let's just write everything in terms of theta. That whole square root thing becomes r cosine theta. What's dx? r cosine theta d theta. Does anybody have a question? Yes. yes. So we're not using 16 on table of integrals? 16 on table of integrals? No, because it's in the denominator. That formula is 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared, right? That's that, I mean, it's good that you saw that, but you see now, if um, you don't have reference page 17. But here, look at this real quick. Look at formula 30 on that, top, top right, formula 30. That's what we need, but you don't get that reference page. But well, only, not because I'm torturing you, but at some point you got it. I mean, I, how many am I supposed to give you, you know? 
is 120 formulas here. You don't want 120 formulas. So what does this integral become? New page. Integral, r cosine theta, r cosine theta, d theta. r squared is going to come out. Cosine squared theta, d theta, right? How do you do that integral? Power reduce or half angle identity, have it double, yeah, half angle. This is the one where I'll do, I'll rewrite cosine squared theta as one half plus one half cosine two theta d theta. That okay? Now, do the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of one half? One half theta, right? So I'll put the r squared out in front of everything. I have one half theta plus, what's the antiderivative of cosine two theta? So one half and then it hits the one half, so one fourth sine two theta. plus c. Now I need two things. I need to know what theta it was, and I need to know what sine 2 theta was. What was the substitution that we made earlier in the problem? x was r sine theta. So I already know x over r is sine theta. This is where I make that reference triangle. What's theta, and how do you get it? Arc sine of both sides. So you take this equation over here, you take arc sine of both sides, and that gives you theta. So we have r squared, one half, theta is arc sine of x over r, okay, plus, now what about this sine 2 theta? It's kind of screwing everything up, isn't it? Yeah, do that uh, double angle identity, turn it into 2 sine theta cosine theta, right? Sine 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. That 2 hits the 1 fourth becomes a 1 half. Questions? What's sine theta? X over R. What's cosine theta? Well, we have to find this side of the triangle over here, which was R squared minus X squared. So I have R squared. Oh, man. One half. Arc sine X over R plus one half. Sine theta was x over r. Cosine theta is square root r squared minus x squared over r. Close it off. We've got everything back in terms of x now. And so we're ready for the integral, right? I mean, that's the antiderivative. Now we just have to evaluate it at the two endpoints. Follow? What are the two endpoints? zero and r, right? Zero and r. So here we go. I am gonna now come in here and say, I want to take r squared times one half arc sine of x over r plus, let me try and clean this up, x root r squared minus x squared over two r squared and I want to take that whole big ugly thing and evaluate it, zero and r. Let's plug r in first. If I plug in r, here's what I get. r squared, one half. What's arc sine? And I'm plugging the r in for what? For x? 
So I'm plugging it in here for x. What's r over r? 1. What's arc sine of 1? Pi over 2. Because you're saying, what's, what angle gives you, a, what angle do you plug in a sine to get 1? Pi over 2. So this gives you just pi over 2. Plus, now plug r into the other one for x. What happens? Right here, r squared minus r squared gives you 0. That whole thing's gone, isn't it? So I have plus 0 here. Okay, minus. Now plug in 0. When you plug 0 in for x here, 0 over r is 0. Arc sine of 0 is 0. Because you're saying, again, what angle do you plug in a sine to get 0 to come out? 0. So that's 0. And when I plug 0 in over here for x, what do I get? 0, because actually this is the part that kills it off, right? Right? So that's going to be plus 0. So at the end of it all, here's where I am. What do these two multiply to be? Pi over 4. And in front of it, r squared. So I have r squared times pi over 4. But this was only the first quadrant. So multiply by 4. What do you get? Pi r squared. Done. Pretty cool, right? All right, we're done with this section. Um, not sure, what did I assign from there before? You, okay. You should be able to do 1 through 19 odd now. Evens are optional. As, as usual. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to move into 7.2. Everyone have that? I was telling my college algebra class the other day, no, my 0303 class, I was explaining to them we were doing quadratic equations and quadratic formula. You know, quadratic formula, negative e plus or minus square root, all that stuff. And I'd ask, I asked them if they knew where the quadratic formula came from. And, you know, most of them are like daydreaming anyway. But I said, you've heard of Moses, right? Moses had the Ten Commandments, right? On the back of the Ten Commandments were all the math formulas that we needed, right? Anyways, the, the point being that most formulas that we have, geometric formulas, area of circle, volume of sphere, surface area of sphere, all those formulas come from 7.1, 7.2, uh, the next few sections that we're going to do. You can come up with all the formulas. In fact, we'll do the volume of a sphere after, at the end of, well, maybe even today. It just depends on how, how far we go, okay? All right, here we go. Volumes. Do what? Believe that? No, I didn't. I was just, you know, I was just messing with them and I showed them how to get it. Y'all know how you can get that? The, the, uh, what do you call it? Quadratic formula. You can get it by completing the square on a standard quadratic function, equation. All right, here, here's what we got. Y'all ready for this? Here's just the top arc of the sine function, all right? So sine goes like this, back and forth. This is just the first arc of sine. We can find the area under that, no problems, right? All right, what we're going to do now is this. In this section, we are going to take this, and we are now going to move it into three-dimensional space like this, all right? Y'all see that? An arc of sine, of a sine function. So y'all see that in three space now? And we're going to take that function and we're going to pick our rectangle that used to be in here, right? There's our rectangle like that, our rectangle to take that sliver. We added those areas up, right? Now what we're going to do, maybe I'll make it a little wider. There's my rectangle. We're going to take that 
and we're going to wrap it around the x-axis like this. Hold on. Okay? That sliver right there is a disc, right? It's like a disc or like a washer, but not a hollow washer. Just, do you agree? It's like a cylinder. It's like a beer can that's really short. Agreed? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that one little sliver like that, and we're going to add them all up, all the slivers, all the little washers, and that should give us a volume of that thing wrapped around. Now, here's what that looks like after you wrap all the slivers, almost kind of like a football, right? It's three-dimensional. And what we want is the volume of that. Make sense? So the attack to the problem is... And this is why I thought Riemann sums was so important for you to understand, is that if you can come up with a formula for just that one washer, then all we'd have to do is add an infinite number of them up, which means an integral. But we need a formula for that one washer. So let's see if we can recover that formula. And we'll do it by going back to where it began, right here. Let's talk about this. So I, I'm going to go back to my notes. That same idea here. If we take in two-dimensional space, if we take this sine curve that goes like that, we take that one rectangle out here, we, and I'm going to draw it over here to the side, and then I'm going to draw a green dotted line below it. That's going to represent where I'm going to pivot this rectangle around, where I'm going to rotate it around that dotted line. If I do that, I'll get something like this. Uh, now you can do your best to draw this. You know, it takes some time to get used to drawing things like that. But you get this kind of washer effect. Yes? Do you know what the volume of a cylinder is? Pi r squared times the height. So I'll do this as a quick reminder to you down here. When you have a cylinder, I'm going to draw a cylinder sideways laying down because that's kind of like ours is. If you have a beer can laying on its side and you want to know its volume, the volume of this is pi r squared times the height. So the r in the problem is the radius of the can right? And the height is actually the width here because it's laying down, but we'll just still call it height. Does that make sense that that would be the volume? It's kind of cool because what it really is is pi r squared is the area of a circle, right? So it's just the area of this face times basically the depth of it. And that gives you the volume. So go back up to our picture up here. Can you tell me what the radius of our, of our particular sliver is. It's the height of the function, isn't it? So for us, r is actually the function's height. It's f of x. Remember, that's what we used to say when we did area. The height of the rectangle was f of x. And then, if that's our radius, the only thing we need now is the height, which would be for us like how wide that can is. Well, how wide is that can? our can up there dx remember the width was how wide the rectangle was so this little width down here the width of our can is still dx so the volume of that one little slice ro rotated around would be what pi r which for us is our function squared dx. That gives, you, that gives you the volume of that one piece. And now what do you want to do with them? Add them up forever. So that's an integral. And where do you want to go from? A to B. So A, let's say, is here, and B is here. You add them up. You see why... Maybe you see, hopefully you see, because I still believe in this, 
that if I don't cover Riemann sums, this is a little more difficult to just grasp. I, I don't know. I think it is. Because then I have to convince you why that you get the formula and then you just do an integral without you understanding that the integral is an infinite sum. Like, you know what I mean? You think? I mean, but the idea, the idea of it, the idea of it. All right. So we have basically a formula now. All right. If you want to take a function between a and b, and you want to wrap it around the x-axis, it's just the integral of that formula right there. Yes? G is zero, that's right. Now we'll, we'll go to that next. I'm not ready for that. So we have a function like this, we'll call it f. We want to take it between a and b. We want to rotate it about the x-axis. Now what we usually do when we want to rotate around the x-axis is along the x-axis, watch what I put at the end of the x-axis, like a little arrow, curved arrow, that just means I'm going to rotate it around the x-axis. See my little arrow? Sometimes you draw another one next to it like that, so your rotation's that way. Then you get this three-dimensional solid. Now, if you, if you can draw it, you can draw it. If not, don't worry about it. I, I don't really put too much into my drawings because I know a computer is going to do a way better job than me. That would be a basic. It's that solid, right? And then the volume of this thing is going to be equal to the integral from A to B of pi. Now the pi could come out in front of the integral because pi is a constant, right? The function squared dx. And that's it. Pretty plain to see. Right? Yeah, you just subtract it. Well, it's going to be a little, we're, we just have to pay attention to it, but it'll be as pretty much as simple as that. Now, I'd like to, since we're, it's fresh in our minds, why don't we just go ahead and get the volume of a sphere now? Right? Find a formula. for the volume of a sphere radius r. We just did area, now we're going to do volume. So you have to look at a sphere and think about where it comes from. Where, does this, where could you get a sphere by doing what? Rotating what? got to be a sphere though, right? Isn't, if I take a circle and I just spin it, don't, doesn't that make a sphere? So why don't we go back to the picture we just had? Why don't we take that first quadrant again that went out to R? Why don't we take that and instead of finding the area underneath it, why don't we just spin that one, that just that one region right here, why don't we spin that around the x-axis? If we do, we'll create half a sphere, won't we? And we'll just double that answer, and that'll give us our volume. The reason why I want to do that is we just had this integral. Didn't we just set up something like this? We already know that this, when we solve for y, gave us y was equal to square root r squared minus x squared, right? That's what we had. That's our function. Well, we spin it one time to get the right side of the sphere, and then we double the answer, just times two, to get the whole thing. You all with me? Okay, here we go. So now we are going to do the integral. Integral from A to B for us is what? Zero to R of pi. Now, here comes pi on the outside. Pi times the function squared. Oh, that's great, right? 
because our function has a square root on it. So when we square it, the square root's gone. So no trig sub or anything. It's, it's, it's perfect. <coughs> and then behind it, dx. Does everyone understand that that is the pi r squared dx? Or pi times the function squared dx. Now integrate with respect to x. What's the antiderivative of r squared with respect to x? r squared x. Look at r squared as being like the number 4. What's the antiderivative of 4? Four? 4x. So what's the antiderivative of r squared? r squared x. Yes? Okay, now what's the antiderivative of x squared? 1 third x cubed. We are going to evaluate this from 0 to r. Plug in r first. Let's see what we get. Pi. <coughs> Plug in r for x. What do you get there? r cubed minus 1 third r cubed. Okay, and then plug in zero, so you get pi, is it just all zero? Oh yeah, it's just all zero. Questions? What's r, third, r to the third minus one third r to the third? Two thirds r to the third. So, I mean, we're pretty much here. It's two-thirds pi r to the third, right? That's what we get. But that's only half the sphere. Double it. Double it. So if you multiply that by two, you get what? Four-thirds pi r cubed, which is the formula for the volume of a sphere. That's much easier, right? I mean, that's easier than the area is. Let's try this, or let's, let's go to a different concept now. Uh, if we have a function, just like we had before, f, and now below it we have this function g. And I want to take that and I want to spin it around the x-axis. Rotate about y equals 0. What's y equals 0? It's the x-axis, right? Okay, so that's just another way of saying it. When I take this rectangle in here and I wrap it around the x-axis, it's different than what we had before, isn't it? In fact, if I draw out my rectangle like this, here's the rectangle I'm going to wrap around the x-axis. My rotation axis is down here below it, isn't it? And so when I wrap it around, I don't get a solid washer anymore, right? I actually get a washer with a hole in the middle of it. So it'll look something like, well, I'll just draw it over here. Something to that effect, right? Hmm? Now my red, my red function was the top of that. The blue one was the bottom, wasn't it? The red one was the top and the blue was the bottom and I wrap it around like that. So there's two ways to look at this. One way is just to kind of rationalize that it would be a certain formula or to, to think of it this way. I, I, like, I prefer this approach. What if I take, forget the blue functions even there. 
That would be the solid red one wrapped around, right? Solid, no hole in it. Then take the blue one, forget the red ones there, and wrap, wrap the blue one around. I would get a smaller one, wouldn't I? Isn't the one with the hole in it just this red one minus the blue one? It's just those two subtracted. So what's the red one? The integral pi f squared dx. What's this one? Pi g squared dx. Yeah? So this integral over here is integral, well, pi f of x squared dx, and then minus the other one, pi integral gx squared dx. We can combine those into the same integral. Put them together, because we're just subtracting them. So put them together. And what you get is the pi is common in both, so pull that out. Integral f of x squared minus g of x squared dx. And I didn't put my, in, my limits of integration, but they would be from A to B here, wouldn't they? I'll just tack them on here at the end. A to B, uh, put them up here on the picture. A, B. So that's our formula, all right? This is it right here. That's right, I did the, I did the minus G squared. That's right. Now, well, I subtracted the lower one squared. See, it really, when you, when you think about it, it could, could have been one of two things. It's either the f function squared minus the g function squared, which, which it is. Or sometimes people make the mistake of thinking you do f minus g in parentheses squared. That you do the subtraction first, then square that. Do you see the difference? Here it says you square the f, you subtract g squared. You don't subtract the two, then square. That'll give you the wrong answer. This right here takes the larger one, subtracts the smaller one. That's what this does. But it helps us see... See, I should have done what, what I normally do in this. I, I ask students to guess what the formula is for this without showing them anything. And, and a lot of times I'll get this. I'll get integral A to B. Well, just don't write it down. This is what a lot of students will think it is. Pi out here. They say, okay, now that you have two functions, I subtract. That's my new F, and then I square. See what I'm saying? That's wrong. It's each one of them squared individually, then subtracted. Which I think is difficult to understand unless you understand it geometrically, what's happening. All right. Everyone have that formula, pretty much? It's in there? Let's do one. How about we find the volume... There we go. Find volume of solid formed by revolving the region bounded by y equals one-fourth x squared and y equals five minus x squared about the x-axis. So 
So we have a region bounded by two functions, right? Just like we did before, we're asking for that area, right? No more. Now what we want is that region that's bounded by the two. I want us to wrap that region around the x-axis. And that will form a solid, and I want to know the volume. So the same, it's almost the same exact setup. The only difference is the integral. You still draw the regions. You still have to find where they hit each other so you can get your bounds on your integrals. You still draw a rectangle. Yeah, I mean, it's, everything's pretty much the same. It's just the formula at the end. So now we would go to our calculators or whatever, or however we are going to graph. And I'm not going to go through that. You should get, let's see, the parabola, this one here, y equals 1 fourth x squared should look like this. 5 minus x squared is a parabola that it opens down, like that. And so you can hopefully see the region, right? It's all this in here. I can't believe I'm going to drive to Austin after this. <laughs> Shit. I know. I should. Okay, here's my rectangle in here. That's what it's going to look like, right? So this is where I'm going to start getting very systematic with things. Well, I, I'm never very systematic, but this is about as systematic as I get. I'm going to draw the rectangle over here. I'm going to draw my axis of rotation down here. Now, my axis of rotation is below the region in some places, right? In the rectangle I drew, that axis of rotation is below it a little bit. The function that's on top is that black one, and the function on the bottom is that blue one. Y'all see how I'm doing this? Trust me, this will help you if you, if you kind of get this picture into that picture. It'll help you for where we're going with this. Y'all see that? Okay, I'm going to label those functions. The one on top is the y equals 5 minus x squared. The one on the bottom is what? 1 fourth x squared. So what I would like for you to do, again, because of where we're heading, what I'm going to do right after this example, is that when we start doing these problems, we start rotating things around these axes. Imagine that you're standing on the axis of rotation. Okay? So like you're standing here and you walk up, you know, like I'm walking up, I'm standing on the axis of rotation, I'm looking out that way. The function furthest away from me, I'm going to start referring to as the outer function, outer function here for us is what? 5 minus x squared. The inner function is 1 fourth x squared. It's going to basically be now the outer function, well, pi, the integral, right, pi, the outer function squared minus the inner function squared. Yes? Yeah? That'll be the I'm going to label this from here to here, right, that's my outer, and then the inside one goes from here to here, that's in, inner. And would everyone agree that the distance from me to the outer function is just the outer function value? Right, because I'm standing on the x-axis. So this is from me, the distance from me to that parabola is actually the value of the parabola. And then the distance from me to the bottom of this parabola, right, is just the parabola. Now why am I getting, why am I saying this? Well, because the next problem we're going to do, I'm going to take the same example, but I'm going to move our axis of rotation down. So now we're going to take that same region, and we're going to rotate it around this axis instead of this axis. And that won't give us the same solid will it? It'll look kind of the same, but it's kind of like if I say, take this circle and wrap it around this axis. I would just go around, I'd have this little like donut, right? But if I move this axis down, I say now wrap it, I'm going to have a hula hoop. It's a very different volume. 
So we need to understand this idea of what's the distance from you, your axial rotation, to the edge of that rectangle. That's where we're going to be able to, to get a lot of the complicated stuff to not be complicated. All right. Here we go. Let's set up the integral. Oh, by the way, the, the uh, points of intersection, you would get those by setting them equal to each other. I'm not going to show. It's negative 2 and 2. So my integral becomes integral. Here's my pi that's going to come out. Negative 2 to 2. The outer function, which is the 5 minus x squared, but that function what? squared minus the inner function, one-fourth x squared squared dx. So if you were to integrate that, how would you integrate that? I'm not going to do it, but how would you do it? Yeah, why don't you just multiply that all out? Just multiply it all out. It's a bunch of powers of x. Collect like terms, power rule. You don't need any fancy substitutions or integration by parts or trig sub. It's just, yeah, I mean, that's just a clean old integral. We good? I'm going to move on. I want to do the same exact problem. I'm not going to write all the instructions down again, just the end. It was y equals uh, 1 fourth x squared y equals uh, 5 minus x squared. I want to rotate about y equals negative 5 this time. So not the x-axis anymore. So I'll go with my drawing. I think I'll use green and blue for my function this time. Well, that's not green. Okay, so I've got one parabola that's doing this. That was the y equals 1 fourth x squared. Then I have the other one which opened down that looks like this. That was the y equals 5 minus x squared. So that hasn't changed. I have a rectangle inside. Does everyone understand that that, that rectangle is arbitrary? Meaning it, I could have, if I wanted to, drawn my rectangle over here or right in the middle. I always like to pick a spot where I've got the function on bottom and top easy to see, right? It's easy to see that which one is, is controlling the top of the rectangle, which is controlling the bottom. I already know my endpoints, my intersection points, negative 2 and 2. Now my axis of rotation. My axis of rotation is at negative 5, so it's way down here. Yeah? And I'm rotating that sliver all the way around that. So I come over here on the side, I draw my rectangle again, draw my axis of rotation down way below it. And you know, I move that up a little bit. I'm gonna draw something through here, but I'm gonna erase it in a second. Just remember, this is the x-axis, right? That's the x-axis. Well, I don't like that. Try and get. This is my x-axis right there. That's my x-axis. So my rectangle is above the x-axis. My axis of rotation is way down here now. I have the blue function coming through the top of the rectangle. I have the green function coming through the bottom like this. I'm trying to rotate that yellow area all the way through. So stand on the axis of rotation down here your little guy looking out this direction and tell me about the distance from you to the outer edge of the rectangle. How far is that from you? 
And think of it as, that's right, it's the function's value plus five, isn't it? First, you have this distance that goes from here to here. That's five units. The fact that you're negative, don't worry about it. It's a distance. Because at the end, aren't we going to square? Right? We're gonna, so it doesn't matter because when you square it, the negative is not going to matter. So the distance is going to be five plus how much more? The function itself. So this is five. And then from here all the way out here, well, that's the function's distance. And that's just what? Five minus x squared. You add those two together, and that's your outer distance. What's your inner distance going to be? Again, 5 plus 1 fourth x squared. <clears throat> so let's set up the integral then. I wonder if it's open bar. That'd be nice. Integral, ah, pi. Integral negative 2 to 2. And start throwing out the window, the whole idea of f squared minus g. It's outer squared minus inner squared. Outer squared minus inner squared. So your outer is what? It, yeah, it's the 5 plus the 5 minus x. So it's 10 minus x squared. Squared. Minus the inner, which is the 5 plus 1 fourth x squared. All of that squared dx. Just pull the pi out, yep. And if, if I were going to solve this, just multiply it all out. Can you see that on, a, on your next test, I'm basically going to be giving you regions. I'm going to say, find, you know, find the area of this region bounded by these curves. Now rotate that region around the x-axis. Now rotate that region around y equals negative 5. Then something like this. Why don't we do the same problem rotating it around the region, or uh, rotating that region around the line y equals 10. So now I'm going to put the rotation axis above the region instead of below it. And let's see how that changes things. So same problem, same functions. Are y'all kind of catching on to this, though? Okay, about, what's that? Yeah, this is stuff that a lot, if you've seen calculus in, in high school or something like that, they do a lot of this stuff. All right, let's do this. Same picture. Same rectangle. By the way, I'm going to want pictures. The deal is this. You don't have to evaluate the integral on the test, but you have to show me the picture, show me the reading, show me the setup. Show all that detail. My rotation axis is way up here at 10 now. So I'll just put it up here. All right, that's 10. So to the side of this, I think I'll draw the axis of rotation again. I'll put my rectangle down here. I'll put the functions that bound it again, the blue and the green. I'll put my, my x-axis down here just so we know where it is. I'm not rotating around the x-axis, right? I just want to have some relative position. And now I'd like to rotate that. Questions? Outer and inner change, because I'm standing on the axis of rotation. I'm looking out towards it now. And when I look out, the one that's furthest away from me now is the one, the blue one, right? 
But I'm not really interested in the blue one's value. I'm interested in the distance from me to the blue one. Right? So let's talk about this distance. And maybe it'll help to get this distance from here to here. If you can talk a little bit about the distance all the way. What would the distance all the way to the x-axis be? 10. Right? So from me, I'm looking, I'm standing like this, I'm looking. At, from me, all the way to the x-axis is 10. But then 10 minus however big that piece is. And that piece is the function's value. So if from here to here is the 1 fourth x squared, right? And from here to here is 10. You following? Then this one is 10 take away 1 fourth x squared. That's the one we'll use. Now what? That's my outer. The inner one, right? I want to know distance from here to here. Well, I know the distance all the way is what? 10. I know the distance from here to the bottom is... 5 minus x squared. So this distance must be 10 take away 5 minus x squared, which is going to turn out to be 5 minus x squared. Yes? What I won't take is just the integral. Yeah. If you can, what I would want on the test is this and this. You don't have to have all the other parts labeled. If you can just look at that and say, oh, yeah, obviously that's 10, <laughs> then you take away, yeah, that's fine. Yes? Five. Wait a minute. Five. Oh, I just didn't distribute, yeah, I didn't distribute the nine, minus two there. It's, five, it's 10, then take away the function's value. That should have been one of two things. Put it in parentheses or distribute. I'll put it in parentheses. Just so, just so you can see on the next step, when I put in the integral, I'll go ahead and distribute through. So 10 take away that much. So the integral becomes integral negative 2 to 2, pi outside. I have the outer function squared. 10 minus 1 fourth at um, x squared squared minus the inner radius squared, which is that 10 minus the 5 minus x squared. I'm going to go ahead and distribute through the negative. So 5 plus x squared squared dx. That's it. Now, as you might imagine, you know, what would come next? I mean, I, haven't we taken every possibility here? We've left the x-axis here. We've put the x-axis lower. We've put it above, right? I mean, not the x-axis, the axis of rotation. Here, one below, one above. Why don't we rotate around the y-axis now? Right? Instead of rotating this way, why don't we rotate that thing around this way? You know, you'll get a di you get a different shape, right? Wouldn't you? If you go back to the original problem that we started this whole idea with, you took that one sine arc like that, and we rotated it, and we got a football, didn't we? If we go around the x-axis. But if I rotate this around the y-axis, you don't get a football. You get this weird-looking... I don't even know how to draw this. It's like, it's like a... Um, yeah, like a donut that doesn't, that pinches off in the middle and you cut it, you know, or almost like a bagel. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Is what? Oh, yeah, like a bunt cake mold or something. Yeah, it's something like that, but it wouldn't have a hole in the side. But the idea is there, right? Very different geometric shape than it, but doing it around the x-axis. And there's actually ways to rotate things around just arbitrary lines where it's not even vertical or horizontal. But that we won't do. That's, that's pretty complicated.
Uh, trying to see if there's. Let's. I, I want to. I want to keep the y-axis for tomorrow, or for tomorrow. Yeah, no tomorrow. For Tuesday, I'm going to save y-axis. Um, how would we deal with something like this? How about if we had y equals negative x squared, y equals x squared minus 5. So this is very similar to the one we just did. Very similar. In fact, let me make this negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth x squared and x squared minus 5. I'm going to draw it real quick, and then let's talk about the where I want to rotate it. This one is negative 1 fourth x squared. This one is what? x squared minus 5. Here's our rectangle. What if you went around the x-axis? The thing is, I put the region below the x-axis on purpose here because I want to see how we, how we handle this. If you go around the x-axis, rotate around the x-axis, when I draw this, my axis of rotations like this, here's my rectangle. I've got the blue here. I've got the red here. And so I'm looking out from my axis of rotation out towards this. How far away is the red? What's that distance from me out to that? X squared minus 5. What, what do you think? Will it matter in this case? Why not? What, what I'm saying is, if, if we're below the x-axis, that's a negative distance, isn't it? Isn't it negative? But, right, plug in a value. If I, if I plug in a value here, it's going to spit out a negative answer, isn't it? So when I'm looking down there, the distance is a distance, but the value of the function is actually a negative value. But you're going to square it, right? So it's going to turn positive. In this case, it will. Because what if your axis of rotation isn't there? It's going to be a little tricky. Do you all follow what I'm saying? Just, just stick with me for just a moment. Our distance, the distance from us to the end, right? This distance right here. If you want it as a distance then you need to look at its positive value. Since it's negative, we need to look at its positive value, which would be the opposite of what this function is. Agreed? So as a distance, just as a distance, as a positive value, it would actually be what? 5 minus x squared. The opposite of x squared minus 5. Which again, with the axis of rotation being the x-axis, it wouldn't matter if you got that wrong. But if I move the axis of rotation, that may not be the case. What's the distance on the inside here, from here to here? Yeah, the opposite, because it's negative, you would want to look at the opposite. So it would be one-fourth x squared. Now, if you set up this integral, negative 2 to 2, pi is outside, the outer function squared minus the inner function squared dx. See, the squared is going to take care of it all, so it wouldn't matter with the axis of rotation being where it is. That's only if it's symmetric. That's only if this right side was equal to what's on the left side, which in this case it would be. But I doubt you're going to save yourself much time going from 
zero to two and doubling it than if you just went from negative two to two. Can you have it? Yes. Can I go? Can I use the same problem? Can I go on a different axis real quick? Okay. Let me go on a different axis. I want to do that same exact problem, but I want to go around y equals three. All right. Y equals three. So my picture is going to look the same. Here's my axis of rotation. Here's the x axis. My rectangles down here. I've got the red function on the bottom and the blue one on the top. I'm standing on the axis of rotation looking out this way and I'm saying, how far away are you? So it's three right? Three plus this distance, right? Now it matters. Because do you agree that that's a negative value? Like, t let's take a value and just plug it in. How about one? Just go out here to one, plug it in. Where are you at one? You're at negative four, right? You're negative four. So if I say, how far would I be from this bottom down here? How far away would, oh, how far away would I be from that here if I was over one? Well, you're, if you say three plus the function's value, the function's value was what? Negative four. So three plus negative four is what? Negative one. So you're telling me I'm, I'm negative one away from that? Even one away doesn't make sense. Do you see? We have to accommodate for not only the distance from me to the axis, but the true distance from that axis to the edge of the function. And if it's a negative value, we need to compensate for that negative by making it positive. I don't know if that's addressing your concern. See, we'd have to use 5x, 5 minus x squared here. So what we would get for the outer, right? In the integral, we'd have pi, we'd have negative 2, 2. We'd have the outer one, which would be those two added together, wouldn't it? So it'd be 8 minus x squared, then squared. Now, let's say you had done it differently and you had not made that compensation for the sine. Then you would have had 3 and you would have been adding... Uh, what, x squared minus 5? The true function value. Then you would have had pi. You would have had, what, x squared minus 2 squared? Those aren't the same thing. One of them's right, one of them's wrong. So it gets, it gets tricky when you start having regions that are negative or in the, below the x-axis and your axis rotation is up above it. Or even, what if I drop that axis of rotation below it? Then you start getting complicated also. So the only way to get good at that is just mess with these. I don't know, does that? So, so when, you, when you change the signs, five minus, uh -huh. you're actually that in, in what? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm trying to look at this as like an absolute value, like a distance, like a true distance. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking is that if I change the signs, you're actually taking it off the side and putting it above the axis. Sure, you can look at it that way. I was thinking, can we look at it as uh, if it's all on the x-axis, we multiply the function by negative 1? Yes. We you, you, it, you're, we're multiplying the function by negative 1 to change its signs. To change what, because it, it's giving us negative values. We don't want those negative values. We want them to be positive. So we change the sign. If you rotate on the axis of rotation, when it comes up here, you would get the same distance from the axis of rotation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Say again. 
put your rectangle on top and say, okay, what would it be up there? Then the distance would be three, then plus the opposite. Yes. But putting it up there is putting a negative one in front of it. Exactly. Okay, if that makes sense that way, that's essentially what's happening. Yep. Okay, uh, we're out of time. I don't have the assignment. I'll email the assignment. I'm sorry. But I got to run anyway. Well, you know, I've got the book right here. I can just at least tell you what to get started on on this. I accidentally email you the solution manual. All right. This is just a real quick look at this. Uh, page 378. One. I've got to pick all the ones that go around the x-axis only. Five. Six I did in class. That we just did. Nine. Ten. You asked for it. I'm just telling you what you could, what you would be able to do at this point. 15, 18. All right. Those are the problems that all the regions are rotated around the x-axis or a line that's moved up or down. None of those go around the y-axis. We'll deal with that next class. Upload what? The video? You know what? I'll do it right now. I'll just sit right here and I'll just plug right into it and I'll upload it. In, into geometry?